When you're building a game, one of the first things you're going to do is pick a perspective for the player to take on when they go to play. This is a key decision to make because it dictates everything further down the road and heavily influences how the game will look and feel as the game progresses. A first-person perspective is a very popular choice. It's very easy to tell a story when you're looking directly out of the eyes of a character. During this process, as the developer, you're going to do your best to add little nuances to give otherwise mundane actions some juice. These little juicy flares are what aggregate together to create what's called game feel. Game feel isn't an exact science. Things that work for one game may not work for another. But for first-person games, an almost universal feature is to add some kind of sway or bobbing of the player's hands and the items they're holding. It's an often subtle but important part of the nonverbal feedback we give to the player, and is a key part to making the first-person perspective feel grounded. And without it, the player's actions can seem very stiff or unnatural. It's also easier to implement than you may think. Just a few lines of code to give your game some juice. So, let's get into it. As you can see here, we're in a very simple Unity project. This is a fairly simple script that can be implemented quite easily by anyone. So to limit the amount of other code already here, I'm once again using the Character Movement Fundamentals package. It's the same package I used when discussing weapon clipping in my other tutorial. So what we're doing today can be broken into two halves, sway as a result of camera movement, and bobbing as a result of the player walking around. Each of those also has two components, the translation or position change, and a rotation change. All of those then get layered on top of each other for the final result. For the tutorial, I've also added a few toggles to turn each feature on and off, as well as making the code as human readable as I could. This isn't necessarily how you'd want to write your code in your project, but for the sake of the tutorial and explaining the ideas, it should be very helpful. So walking through our setup very quickly, at the very top we have all of our external references needed for this to function. I'm using the character movement fundamentals pack, so I've got references to the relevant input scripts for WASD and mouse movement. I also have a reference to the mover, which is what checks if the character is grounded. And lastly, I have a reference to the character's rigid body, since this is a rigid body character controller and we're going to need the velocity. Below that, I have a few toggles to turn each function off for the purposes of demonstration. You don't need these, but they're helpful in my case as I explain what's happening. After that, you can see the update function, showing our order of operations. And the very first function it's going to run is this get input function to store our WASD and mouse movement as vector 2s. Each function thereafter has the relevant variables in a vector 3 to store the result in. The two functions we're going to cover first deal with sway as a result of camera movement. The first, which I'm simply calling sway, deals with the position change. It has two public variables. One I called step, which is a fairly small value we make negative and then multiply by our look input. This is to both reverse the vector's direction and make it significantly smaller, from multiple units to a fraction of that. We then clamp the x and y values by our max step distance. Then we store that value and continue on. The sway rotation is very similar. Once again, we just have two floats, one for our rotation step and one for our max rotation. Just like before, we flip the input with a negative and then clamp it. However, this time the values are in a different order. We use the Y value in the X spot because that's what controls the pitch axis of our game object. Similarly, we use the X value in the Y spot because that's what controls our object's yaw axis. The Z value is our roll axis. You can experiment with this, but I like using the X value here as well because it looks like you're turning the object with the direction of motion. And then we store that value as well. To give this a quick test, let's jump down to our last function. Here we're setting the transform's local position and rotation using alert between its current value and the value we stored, using time and a smoothing value to ease into the target position. With that in place, we can now enter play mode and see it in action. Pause the video and play with the variables until you find what feels right. The default variables I'm using here are the exact same ones I'm using in my main project, but the game feel of your game may be different. All right, cool. You've fine-tuned your sway from your mouse movement, now it's time to move on to the slightly more complicated topic of procedural bobbing. This is something I've actually not seen many people talk about, I suspect because it involves trig functions to create sine and cosine waves. However, because of that, I'm able to plug them into a graphing calculator to show what's actually happening. First, we need to generate our waveform. For this, I created a float called speed curve, which is time.delta time times either our rigid body's speed or one, depending on our grounded state. This same value is used by both the offset and the rotation, so I put it before the if statement so it's iterated either way. It'd make more sense to be in the update function before both of these functions, but again, I'm going for human readability for the tutorial rather than good coding practice. Continuing on, we plug our speed curve value into both a sine and cosine function to generate our waves. Now we can actually do some calculations to get our desired position and rotation. For the basic position bobbing, we're essentially using our curves to generate a unit circle and then scaling it by some value. I didn't do this in the calculator, but in code I have this value stored as a vector 3 with a fairly small magnitude. I also have this condition here to check if we're grounded as well. The reason being the side-to-side -side component of bobbing should only occur if you're actually walking, but not if you're jumping or otherwise in the air. After that, we factor in player input to offset the circle based on the direction they're traveling. 
This includes a value to act as a maximum offset, which again is a vector 3 with a small value. It should be noted that the y value uses the y velocity of the rigid body. The other values will be between negative 1 and 1, but your y velocity can be significantly higher than that. So I suggest you add an extra 0 to its limit. If you take a look at the graphing calculator, you can see we're adding these value offsets to the unit circle by an equal and opposite value to the input. Congrats, you now have a thing that moves in a circle at a rate dependent on your speed. This may not seem like much, but the rotation is what actually does the heavy lifting in this case. First thing you may notice is that each of these values first checks to see if the player is walking to determine what value to provide. Assuming that the player is walking, the x and y components come together to rotate the object in a figure 8 pattern. The z component then rocks the object from side to side, using our x component of our walk input to determine by how much. If you're walking straight ahead, this will be 0, but if you're strafing to the side, this will be either 1 or negative 1. Each of those values then also has a multiplier to simply adjust how noticeable the movement is. If you aren't moving, then most of your values will be 0, except for movement around the x-axis to simulate breathing while standing still. Now if we hop down to the last function again, we can add our bobbing values as well. For the position change, we simply add the vectors together, but quaternions need to be multiplied together instead. I suggest you play with the values to figure out what might seem right for your project. I noticed if you turn the multiplier for the bobbing rotation way up, it almost looks like the character is waddling instead of walking steadily, which might be what you're going for. I will say the code I'm using in this video is a bit different from what I'm using in my project. This was actually an excuse to go back and rewrite that code to make it make more sense. My first pass at the procedural bobbing was mostly me messing with values and conditions until I got something that looked halfway decent. But it's a fairly dense bit of code, so this video allowed me to go back and break down what is actually happening. Once this video goes out, I'll replace it with the code we wrote today, after a minor refactor to work with my character controller instead of the one from this package. Big shout out to Janik or Yannick for the suggestion to make this video. If you guys have suggestions for more videos you'd like to see, be it tutorials or videos on other topics, be sure to leave a comment down below. If you've enjoyed and found this video helpful, be sure to drop a like. And if you want to follow progress on my main project or catch my other videos as they come out, be sure to subscribe. And I will see you next time.